Great. That, thank you for the introduction. It's a pleasure for me to be invited to um, participate in the symposium. And these are my disclosures. So 25 years ago, um, Dr. Jeffrey Hounsfield, during his acceptance speech for the Nobel Prize, um, showed one image of a cardiac CT. And over those past 25 years, technology has evolved. And what I'm going to go over in the next 20 minutes is what the state of the art of cardiac CT is today. So with a Quillian 1 CT scanner, you're able to scan the entire heart. You can scan up to 16 centimeters of coverage on 320 detectors um, within one heartbeat. Now, if you don't have a wide volume scanner, this is um, the type of image quality you get. You have misalignment or stair step artifacts, um, particularly, particularly here in the LED. There will be banding artifacts uh, from um, different arrival of contrast through the um, heart and myocardium. However, if you have a 320 detector scanner, you will have temporal uniformity because you're able to image the entire heart within one heartbeat. So you have no misalignment or stair step artifacts, there's no banding artifacts. And since you have better image quality, you're able to translate anatomic findings into physiology. Since you're able to image the entire heart at once, you um, have the ability to, within one scan, choose the best face. And actually, the scanner chooses the best face for you through um, um, the auto selection. And here in this example, this is a patient with a heart rate of 59, which typically does not have any um, coronary motion artifact. But at the two extremes, there is a motion artifact in the right coronary artery. But then again, the scanner will automatically choose the best for, uh, phase for you for interpretation. So, so with the best quality images, how well does um, 320 detector row CT work? So in our hands of um, 151 patients, we have very high diagnostic accuracy. And in addition to diagnostic accuracy, we now are starting to get prognostic information where patients who do not have obstructive disease have a excellent prognosis, whereas people who do have obstructive disease over time have cardiac events or revascularization. Um, alluding to the prior speaker, there is a concern over radiation exposure. So in one seminal uh, paper about um, eight years now, uh, this really um, opened up people's eyes in terms of what is the danger of cardiac CT. Because at this time, cardiac CT was an evolving technology. And based on the technology of that time, which was a retrospective gating, the estimated risk of developing malignancy um, was quite variable. But for a 20-year-old female who received a cardiac CT, it was estimated that their chance of developing malignancy in um, that lifetime was about 1 in 143. At least in the US, the utilization of CT has been dramatically increasing. It's been, um, the annual growth has been more than 10% per year despite the population of the U.S. increasing less than 1% per year. Um, year after year, in both the um, medical literature and in the lay press, there's been concerns over radiation exposure. Um, what I'm going to highlight with you is my initial um, experience with a Colleen One Vision, which is a second generation scanner. The NIH was very privileged to receive the, uh, one of the first vision scanners um, from Japan. So real briefly, the difference between uh, the Vision or the second generation Aquilian 1 versus the original Aquilian 1 is that they're both 320 detector scanners. Uh, the Vision has a faster gantry rotation time of 275 milliseconds. It has a wider bore uh, and has a larger X-ray generator. And this is particularly useful for imaging larger patients. The image reconstruction speed is faster, uh, and this is important. Um, um, especially with uh, new generation image reconstru reconstruction. Now, obesity is, is a worldwide epidemic. Um, the U.S., unfortunately, is leading the obesity, um, the growth in obesity. But uh, as you can see here, that uh, the European countries are also um, have increasing rates of obesity and also in Asian countries. Now, when we look at, at our experience, uh, we did not exclude anybody uh, for body size. So, um, with our initial experience, the green are people who are normal size, yellow are people who are overweight, red is obese, and uh, purple are morbidly obese. And almost two thirds of the patients are either overweight, obese, or morbidly obese. So here's one example. So this is a uh, um, one patient, she's about 70 years old. 
who had a new onset of, of um, new diagnosis of congestive heart failure, and they want to exclude an ischemic etiology of heart failure. Uh, her BMI was 45, she was over 100 kilos and about 1.5 meters tall. Uh, it only gets worse because she had uh, a frozen right shoulder and was not able to move her right arm out of the field of view. So this was scanned with her uh, right arm down, and this is the type of image quality you can get. Uh, it's completely diagnostic. I can confidently exclude uh, obstructive disease as an etiology. Um, it, it, so ischemic heart disease is not an etiology for heart failure. We did not um, select people for heart rate. Uh, so here's a distribution of heart rates uh, that we saw. Um, and some patients are not able to be beta blocked. Their heart rates uh, are persistently high. Here's an example of a patient with a heart rate of 95. Um, this is a scan of segmented over two beats. And this is the type of image quality you can get. It's completely diagnostic. Arrhythmias can be very challenging. A patient with a PVC and also a faster heart, your heart rate of 87. And with the equivalent one vision, you're able to stop cardiac motion and, and have a diagnostic scan. This is one of my favorite scans. This is a, a young patient who um, had a resting heart rate in, in the 50s. And when she received the contrast, you know, the warm sensation uh, was very alarming to her, and she started screaming. And you can see the, the motion artifact in the lung windows. So the heart rate of 94 this is a one-beat scan. You have completely diagnostic uh, and frozen car cardiac motion. Now, when you, when you um, select dose, um, many people use BMI charts to determine what dose uh, to give a patient. Uh, and this is an extreme example. So this is a picture of the, the tallest man in the world with this, um, the shortest man in the world. And they have about the same BMI. But obviously, they do not need the same amount of radiation to, um, to image them. But on the uh, Toshiba scanners, there's um, automatic dose selection, where based on the scout images, the scanner will determine what the proper dose is for that individual patient. And basically, this um, uh, improves image consistency and really gets the lowest dose for the patient for a given image noise. And when you use that type of technology and with iterative reconstruction, the scanner then selects for you the best KV. And in most cases, we're able to use a lower KV. Um, in this case, over 90% of the cases can have 100 KV imaging and, and safe radiation. So here's an example. This is a patient with a BMI of 36 who's obese, who you typically would use 120 KV. But the scanner selects for you 100 KV. And this is actually a submillisievert scan in an obese patient with excellent image quality. So this is our overall uh, radiation um, experience. Um, so over half the scans for cardiac CT is less than one millisievert. And 96% um, of the cases are less than four millisieverts. And what I have to remind you is that this is all comers. We did not select patients out. This was 151 consecutive cases. And this is what, what I call the difficult cases. You know, there are people who are obese, people with fast heart rates, people who did not have sinus rhythm. We had bypass patients. We had combined LV function. So, the, so um, this is what you can expect in your typical clinic. Just to put that in perspective, um, in the Protection One study by York Hausleiter, he did a survey of 50 sites doing cardiac CT at the time. These are published sites, people, you know, experienced users. And across all vendors, there's a huge variability in terms of how much radiation um, was delivered. So on the y-axis is the dose link product, the amount of radiation. And each, each bar graph is each individual site. And there's the median dose and the error bars. So within one site, there's a huge variability in terms of how much radiation dose that is delivered. So with the vision scanner, um, this is uh, what it looks like. So the doses are very low, but consistently very low and very tight in terms of the variability. Here's an example of an ultra-low dose. This is 0.17 millisieverts in an adult patient uh, who's normal-sized. This is a BMI of 21. And when you talk about low dose, you have to make sure that it's an, you have accurate detection of disease. So this, uh, this is a, also a sub-millisievert case. You can see non-obstructive disease in the LED and the obstructive disease in the circumflex. And when you look at invasive catheterization, there's a very high correlation between what we see non-invasively with CT and um, with invasive angiography. 
So when you put this all together, um, you can image very difficult cases. So this is a, a, a case referred from an outside institution. A patient with a seven centimeter air root went directly to uh, invasive angiography to evaluate for um, concomitant coronary disease. They were unable to engage the coronary arteries. So they did a cardiac CT at the outside facility, um, and it's basically non-diagnostic. There's motion artifact. So they refer, refer this patient to me, so on the Quillian One Vision, the heart rate was 80, and I was able to um, definitively um, give a diagnosis of non-obstructive coronary disease in this patient. So other than uh, coronary disease, you can also assess cardiac function. Um, this is a patient with uh, adult congenital heart disease and transposition to great vessels. You can do cardiac function with uh, non-volume scanners. Um, an example here with uh, a 64 slice scanner from another institution. But when you look at these two images, um, you can extract the same amount of information. You're able to assess wall motion and injection fraction. But if you look at the dose difference, this is uh, the, the bottom scan, a non-volume scanner. This was a 33 millisievert exam, whereas on a vision scanner or equivalent one technology, this is a 0.2 millisievert cardiac function exam. This is a 150-fold difference in radiation um, in this application. Now, if you need to look at coronaries and look at wall motion, this is a, a, a gentleman who was referred, um, who had an equivocal stress test that demonstrated an apical aneurysm and ischemia. Well, he doesn't have coronary disease, but we made a diagnosis of apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So one limitation of cardiac CT is calcification. Now, there's multiple areas of calcification, um, and on the corresponding invasive angiogram, only one of them is hemodynamically significant. Stents can also be um, cause uh, non-diagnostic images due to a blooming artifact. And we know from the CORE64 trial that patients with severe calcification have a reduced diagnostic accuracy. Here's uh, one patient who has a calcium score of more than 4,000, very dense calcification in the LED circumflex right coronary artery. Now, sometimes you get lucky. So this patient, on a vision scanner, has a completely diagnostic exam. And I can tell you, this is not a stent. This is native calcification. This is also a, a submillisiever exam. But if you're not lucky, um, what solutions are there to, to deal with calcification? One solution is to, to remove the calcium from the image. Um, and I'll discuss uh, coronary subtraction. The other way is to look for the physiologic um, evidence of uh, obstruction. There's uh, two solutions, either looking at contrast gradients or looking at myocardial perfusion. So briefly, the um, coronary subtraction pr principle is that areas of calcification or stents cause blooming. And if you register a non-contrast image, such as the calcium score, with the CTA image, fuse them, register them and subtract them, all you have is iodine. So it looks more like an invasive angiogram. So here's an example. Here's a post-contrast CT. There's calcification in the, in the, uh, in the uh, proximal LED and in the mid-LED. And if you uh, perform subtraction, you're able to take out those areas of calcification. And the areas correspond well with invasive angiography. And the areas of non-calcified plaque are not affected. There's a case of the coronary stent uh, with you know, a lot of blooming artifact. If you perform cor um, coronary subtraction, you're able to see within the stent and see a very high-grade stenosis, which corresponds very nicely with invasive angiography. So uh, in collaboration with the Riggs Hospital, we, uh, we've evaluated 43 patients, 76 lesions with a um, median calcium agonistin score of 510. And overall, uh, coronary subtraction improves the reader confidence, uh, but most importantly, it improves the positive predictive value from 51 to 71%. Now, if you're interested in coronary subtraction, I invite you um, to sit down with Dr. Fuchs. Uh, after the session, at the hands-on session, where you can work on the workstation and look at these coronary subtraction cases. Now, the other uh, way to deal with uh, potentially non-diagnostic um, segments is to look at um, the functional significance, or in this case, we'll start with uh, gradients. So Frankie Rubicki at the Brigham Hospital pioneered um, the idea of 
great dancing. And you'll notice that because you're using a wide volume scanner and temporary uniformity, you can measure the Hounsfield um, values within the vessel since they're imaged at the same time. And you notice that in arteries that are not stenotic, the amount of contrast uh, pacification um, does not drop as much as areas with um, a stenosis. And he took this one step further by instead of doing two samples, he measured multiple areas of the uh, vessel and was able to get a slope over the vessel to see what um, the gradient is over a vessel. And if you have a stenosis, then the slope is um, sharper than if there is no stenosis. And the nice, uh, the nice thing about this approach is that you don't need a supercomputer. Uh, this can be done on your own workstation. Um, and uh, you know, even though here you have um, artifacts, um, these artifacts get uh, averaged out because you're sampling multiple samples throughout the um, vessel. There's ongoing validation of this technique. The, um, our colleagues over at Monash uh, have evaluated uh, this technique and correlated with um, invasive FFR. And my last topic is I'll talk about myocardial perfusion as the um, alternative way to look at physiology. Um, for those of you who do perfusion, uh, this is a uh, extraction fraction um, versus blood flow. And we know that you know, a perfect perfusion agent such as water has a perfect extraction fraction. On uh, agents, uh, technetium has a lower extraction fraction. But um, preclinical work um, from El Largo and Rich George at Johns Hopkins determined that uh, iodine agents very closely resemble PET uh, myocardial perfusion. So I was involved with the CORE 320 trial, which was a clinical study looking at the combination of a CTA stenosis and a CT perfusion um, defect and compared it versus invasive catheterization and the corresponding expect defect. And this is a representative image. So the CTA shows a, a high-grade stenosis, which corresponds with the invasive angiogram. And on the uh, stress CT, there's a perfusion defect in the anterior wall, which corresponds with the uh, um, stress-induced perfusion defect on the SPECT image. And overall, on a per-patient basis, the added value, there is added value of adding CTP, or stress CT, over rest CT. So rest CT is in red, and there's an increase in the re um, receiver operator curve um, with the addition of CT perfusion. If you look at radiation dose, the, the combination, even though you're doing a second scan, uh, this combination of a, doing a rest CT with a stress CT is lower than doing a conventional SPECT exam, and it's lower than invasive catheterization. And again, if you're interested um, to learn more about myocardial perfusion, I invite you to um, uh, spend time with Dr. Kofed tomorrow uh, in, in the hands-on room um, to learn about myocardial perfusion in clinical practice. So in conclusion, um, the Quillian 1 a scanner is this, um, provides state-of-the-art uh, CT. It's able to do ultra-low radiation doses of uh, less than one millisievert. Um, when you uh, speak about radiation, I didn't speak about this earlier, but um, in terms of dose, the contrast dose is also very low. You can do it for less than 55 cc's of contrast. We've done heart rates up to 95 beats a minute. And uh, with this type of technology, you're able to do um, novel techniques such as coronary subtraction, uh, evaluate contrast gradients, or um, do myocardial perfusion. Thank you for your attention.